Good afternoon. <coughs> we are going to have a second very rich and interesting session. All healthcare systems face cost, con cost containment, quality, access to healthcare quality um, trade-off. This trade-off may involve uh, static and dynamic issues. The first and third presentation by Thierry Maniac and Julien Reeve that we shall have the pleasure to listen, tackle this trade-off in a dynamic setting. Uh, by, dy by dynamic, I mean the basket of technologies um, has uh, to be defined. The second pres presentation by Carol Proper, on the other hand, will analyze um, the team healthcare production by focusing on the possible uh, um, sources of savings for national health insurance system. So please, uh, the first presentation is Thierry Maniac from professor at Toulouse School of Economics. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, talk, so this is joint work with uh, Pierre Dubois. I think that the, there are some slides. The green one, okay. Oh, the green one, yes, sorry. Um, so uh, we want to talk about something that has been talked about this, uh, this morning is the, uh, the, 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 the optimal way of uh, spending uh, expenses on drugs uh, when there are dynamic elements. So instead of having, uh, having uh, uh, um, a bargaining game between health authorities and pharmaceutical firms annually, we could have a, a, a mechanism where uh, there are long-run commitments uh, between the, these companies and the health authorities. And there are, in the literature, there, are, uh, there have been a, a series of papers showing that there could be gains from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, trading off uh, the expenses of a time in, in, a, in, a, in a better way than it's done now. But these gains depend on, on diseases and drugs, and, and I'm going to take the case study of uh, hepatitis C in order to, uh, uh, to show how we could think about uh, the trade-offs uh, that these uh, intertemporal uh, smoothing of expenses over time as, um, uh, uh, as. So uh, let me just remind you, and I, I know that you all know this, but the structural characteristics of hepatitis C, so it's a, it's a non-expensive disease, at least in Western Europe since uh, to the 2000. There were e ineffective drug treatments until the 2010, um, and there are a lot of asympto asymptomatic cases uh, of, of this uh, disease. Uh, uh, and the, the effective drug treatments were introduced in, in 2014, uh, also not for all vi virus uh, genotypes. And, uh, but one characteristic is that the new treatment was uh, more costly than the traditional one. And uh, there were also, at the end of the story, is that other, not the end, but uh, the, the, uh, after that, other treatments introduced between 2014 and 2020, adapting to different genotypes and cocktails of drugs and all this kind of thing. So these, the objective of this paper is, is, is to try to look at the optimal assignment of expenses of a time in order to deal with this epidemic. Uh, so in a sense, what we are trying to do is controlling an, an epidemic uh, here. And, and the important thing in this, uh, in this modeling is the trade-offs between uh, current expenses and future expenses. And we're going to, uh, so we're going to try to uh, um, look at this problem in, in, in a framework, where, in a model which is the susceptible infected recovered model, the standard epidemiology, em, epidemiological pro, um, model in this kind of, uh, of epidemic, with, with this kind of epidemic. Uh, so it's also a way of, of, of re-questioning the uh, measurement of cost effectiveness because you have dynamic uh, externalities due to, due to the infection. So uh, we are going to look to, to have these sort of models uh, where you have susceptibles, ST, infected, IT, and unchecked or undetected infected, UT, and it's going to be an important part of what we're going to say about hepatitis C uh, later. 
We have a natural remission rate, but I, I won't talk about that. And the main assumption that we're going to have, and, and that's typical of these models where you have intertemporal trade-offs, is that you're going to have uh, decreasing returns to treatment by the new drugs. So uh, the curing rate uh, is going to be uh, an effective, uh, a non-time varying increasing and concave function of expenses per patient. So, so there are various, uh, there, if you don't have this sort of uh, assumption, and I'm going to uh, give you some arguments behind this assumption, the best way to control the epidemic is to spend all the money you have now and kill the epidemic and then, uh, then every, everybody is, um, is um, better off in, 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 in the next period. But it's not going to be the case because of this decreasing to ret returns to, s to scale uh, assumption. So why do, why do we have this assumption? So there are medical justifications for, for this. The, the, the first one is uh, et heterogeneous treatment effects, and it depends on virus genotype in the case of uh, hepatitis C. There are also justification due to the organizational capacity to identify the pati patients who benefit the most from the, from the new treatments. And in particular, in hepatitis C, the undetected uh, have, have a role of patients who could be uh, cured, but who, who don't know they are infected. And so it's difficult to identify them. Uh, you, you will have to check um, to test uh, everybody in the population. There are also economic justification. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. There is, uh, there, uh, we have another uh, joint paper where we have a bargaining pricing game between health authorities and, and drug companies. There, are, there is also uh, uh, an argument where uh, the health authorities might think that there are uh, more effective innovations in the future, which is going to give an, another trade, type of trade-off that you have between spending now and spending in the, in the future. So uh, the, the, the dynamics of the epidemic is, is very simple because it's a non-expensive uh, disease. So the long run stable stationary equilibrium is disease free. And what we, we can do is just to accelerate the rhythm at which the, 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 the disease disappears. So health authorities are supposed to uh, uh, be given a certain endowment, A1, that's the difference between the uh, current situation and the, uh, what we imagine here is that they are given uh, an endowment that they can spend uh, uh, over time, but in a way they decide for themselves, optimally, maybe. And, and so we're going to say simply that uh, there are certain expenses every period, capital BT, and they are going to be spent and used in order to curing uh, patients with the new, uh, the new drugs. Though, so implicitly, the cost of tradi uh, the traditional treatment, which is not effective in the sense of not curing for good the uh, disease, is also implicitly included, but I'm not going to talk about uh, this. And one important assumption uh, is also the social welfare. So the social welfare is going to be a convex function of the infected rate. So we, we care about infected uh, uh, people in the population and not uh, well, in a way which is, uh, which is uh, uh, the more so they are more infected, but also it doesn't depend on undetected and checked, and it could be questioned, uh, obviously, as an assumption. Okay, so that's typically what you, what you get when you simulate. We simulate the, 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 the model with, um, with French, calibrating with French data. That's typically what we, you get. So on the, on, the, on, on the vertical axis, you have the rate of uh, prevalence of um, uh, undetected infection and one minus susceptibles. Hopefully that's much, it's, uh, the rate of prevalence is, is quite low. And, and the, the, the blue curve is the rate of infected, the solid blue curve. So that's the natural rate of disappearance of the, of the epidemic. And when you have a policy enacted at period five, you see the dotted curve in blue, and it's, in, it's just accelerating the rhythm at which the disease disappears. So on the unchecked and the non-susceptibles, the effect is not that uh, great, large. Uh, so uh, the, the effect, the first effect of the policy is on the infected, obviously. So what we're going to do first is to try to see if a tool, which is the variational calculus, is, um, help, uh, is useful in terms of deciding about the optimal policy. So the idea is to take the expenses 
of the health authorities is given. This is a flow of expenses, B1, et cetera, until infinity. And uh, there, there is a constraint is that the sum, the discounted sum of these expenses should be equal to the endowment. You spent all the money you have until the, until the end. And the variational calculus uh, means that you're going to play with the fact of moving expenses from one period to the next or, or the, from the next period to the, to the present period. So you increase uh, dBT by a positive number and you decrease the expenses at period t plus one by the uh, discounted uh, uh, value in, in terms of just keeping the expenses of a time constant. So we, 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 we did that, and it's not a very helpful tool in this, in this case. You can see that infection decreases in period t and increases in period t plus one if you reallocate all of your bu budget from t plus one to t. Uh, you, have, you, can, you can compute the indirect benefits, etc., but there are complicated dynamic effects. It's, uh, it's almost impossible to do the analytics of this and, and uh, cl no clear-cut clear -cut predictions. And so we have to resort to simulations in order to try to understand how, how this tool can be, can be used. And the type of thing that you get is this graph. So the scales of the different curves are not comparable, so it's just... Uh, so in the, on, the, on the vertical axis is the impact. For example, on the red curve, this is the impact infected. At the reallocation at, at period nine, uh, from, no, from period nine to period eight, and you see that uh, in this case you get a, a strong decrease of the infected because you increase a lot the budget in period T, but you have a rebound effect because you don't spend anything in period T plus one. And so you have this, and you see that the long-run effect, it's not clear on the infected. It's very close to zero. So that's, uh, I'm not going to comment the other curves, but they are also interesting uh, if I had more time. Okay, so now let's, so this is a tool which can be used, but we can ask uh, ourselves, what, what is the optimal budget policy in this, uh, in this, in this uh, case? So the, the idea is to try to compute uh, the optimal timing uh, the timing of ex optimal expenses uh, by the health authorities. And, uh, and, and so the dynamic of infection is given, are given by the uh, epi epidemiological model, and you have an optimal control of the infection. So technically, it's, it's using simulations. It depends on various hypotheses, in particular preferences for the present of the health authorities. And we're going to compare the optimal policy with a a very conservative policy of consuming interest of the endowment only, a constant policy every period, which is the current situation, let's say, and the optimal policy. So this is what we, what we get. So the, uh, the vertical axis is the asset depletion. So that's the, the asset is equal to 0 0.005 at the beginning. This is roughly three times the cost of the, uh, with the traditional drugs until the disease uh, disappears. Um, and, and then the optimal policy is in uh, solid uh, black. Uh, the constant policy, constant policy every period is the red uh, dotted curve. And the conservative uh, policy is the uh, uh, little dots. So you see that uh, respect to the constant policy, there is a lot of front loading with the optimal policy. You spend a lot more at the beginning in order to try to control the, uh, the infection, much more than the constant policy. Constant policy is, uh, is just uh, uh, very, uh, quite conservative, and the interest revenues is, is, uh, is even more conservative. So what is, how does it impact the, um, uh, the uh, rate of uh, the control of the infection? So uh, this is, these are the same curves. So the solid uh, black is uh, the optimal policy. The constant policy is the red uh, dotted uh, line uh, curve, and the interest revenues are going to uh, is, go, uh, is, uh, is given by the, the small dots. So you see that uh, the optimal policy uh, well impacts the infection much more than the constant policy. It's obvious you spend more money, but the and and the, the gain from the optimal policy is is broadly speaking the area between the, uh, between the black curve and the red curve. So that's the, that's the gain in social welfare that you gain from, uh, from this uh, optimal policy. An interesting aside 
is the rebound. Obviously, at period 10, we have seen in the previous, how do I get back? Uh, yeah, yeah. So you see that after period 10, you, you don't have any, uh, you don't have more money to spend. So you're uh, out of money there. And so there is a rebound of the, of the infection from period 10. And, and that's, that's built up in the, in, in the social, in the optimal policy construction. It's also the preference for the present, which is playing a role here. While with the red curve, you still have money to spend. So, uh, so in fact, the net effect is, the, is, in a sense, the discounted uh, areas of the difference between the red curve and the black curve. OK, so looking at the unchecked, there is not a lot of difference. Uh, so controlling the epidemic through this is not very uh, effective. Uh, on the susceptibles, that's the same, uh, that's the same thing. It's the non-susceptibles, sorry. Um, and so in terms of conclusions, so, so the, 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 first, uh, the first effect is that a disappearing epidemic like uh, um, like hepatitis C, uh, an equal budget policy is certainly dominated by a front-loaded policy because uh, you, you, you try to control the epidemic uh, at the same time as you cure patients. Um, the, the, this result is, is really calibra calibrated w uh, on the hepatitis C case study, so it's, it's really difficult to prove any external validity of the, of the results that I have uh, uh, described to you. Um, and it depends very much on the main trade-offs. So spending more today implies uh, uh, not only less infection tomorrow and, and some dynamic externality, but also less effective cures. But there are strong arguments for this. And uh, there are other things to do. For example, no feedback on the uh, innovation process for the moment, but we're still working on this. Thank you. It was an intertemporal timing. Ah, yeah, 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 of course. Um, at some point, uh, talking about that, you, you mentioned that trade-off between expenses and uh, effectiveness in the future. And at some point, you, you mentioned that uh, you, maybe we may face some uncertainty about uh, regarding new, new um, treat treatments entries. So I, I wanted to know how do you manage uh, this aspect in uh, in the model, and uh, second, um, you define very clearly what should be the uh, the optimal policy. But regarding what you, what we heard this morning about some political constraints to, to implement this uh, this intertemporal uh, policy, uh, what will be your recommendation policies uh, to achieve this optimal path? Okay, so uh, starting with the second question, so uh, Jean Tirol was speaking about the soft budget constraint uh, this morning, and this is exactly what you see in the, in the graph. The rebound of the infection is uh, due in the model to, the soft, to, the, to a hard budget constraint, which is in the model. Uh, do I believe in this? No, I think there are going to be a renegotiation. It's a, what we do here is a, really a normative analysis of what could uh, what the health authorities with all commitment uh, possible could do, but it's certainly uh, not, uh, not the case in reality. So that's, that's an important element that should be taken on board after a while. So one way of doing this is, is that to put constraint on the, on the amount that should be left after a certain period of time. And in particular, using trying the information about the undetected so you, you can have guess, guesses about the, the rate of undetected in the population, which is really fueling the infection. That's the, ca the channel through which uh, uh, the infection is, is going through. Um, obviously, there are other ways of, uh, so you, you might say that there are, that there are mi migrations between different countries, and it's, uh, it's the case of a single country or, and, and this kind of thing. So you, your first question is about how do you deal with the, uh, the optimal trade-off. In fact, we, we don't do it very, um, very uh, rigorously at the moment. So we just assume that it's a fixed, non-time varying function. 
of decreasing returns to scale, but probably it is not because the, the population is changing. Uh, the rate at which the undetected become, become detected affect this function because they are, uh, they are, they are newcomers in, in terms, they are not people who, who, who we, we know that they are, they are with hepatitis C, hepatitis C since, um, uh, since uh, many, uh, for many years. So, um, so we don't do it very well, but the problem is also the data. It's extremely difficult to calibrate this function. So calibrating an, a time varying function with the, quali uh, the quality of the data that we have is, is really, I, I, I don't think it's possible at the, at the moment. Thank you. Questions, Katarina? So I, I'm curious about the prices that you use to do these predictions. The prices? Yeah. We don't have prices. It's just uh, an issue of uh, the health authorities announce a certain uh, health, uh, uh, certain level of health expenses, and that's what is going to be the budget to be spent. Uh, in and, and prices are implicitly uh, constant in, in the. But it's, it's, like an it's really a pure uh, welfare analysis of the uh, a technical analysis. No, I see, but I mean. I guess that uh, a payoff of delaying is that expecting prices to decrease by half or sometimes four times and what you... So you mean uh, we, we didn't compute the supporting prices of this kind of intertemporal equilibrium, well, level of expenses, but we, we could. That's a, good, uh, that's a good point. But we didn't. So uh, you mentioned that, if I understand, that you're judging the optimal optimality of these policies by uh, the number of infections that are being reduced. Um, if we also care to reduce the number of asymptomatic or I think, unchecked uh, individuals, does that affect the conclusions? Yes, um, it does. Uh, yeah, absolutely. What, what is the qualitative effect? Of um, we, don't, we didn't do that, uh, so we have to... Uh, we have to investigate the issue, but certainly it, it does. The difficulty is also to, that we, we, we have to test in the population for, uh, for, uh, for this, and this is not included in the model. But, so an optimal strategy would also be a testing strategy, I think, and, and we should develop more on this line, but we didn't. Just a, a, cl a clarification on uh, your question, Katarina. So we don't have price, but we have the cost of treatment, as we as was observed in France. So in the way we calibrate the effectiveness of the budget, you know, this decreasing, this increasing concave function is calibrated using the cost of treatment that was used in France, that was observed in France, which depend on the price of sofosbuvir and all these drugs. But we have no, as Thierry said, we have no prediction on the future price. We u just use this to calibrate. We, we assume it's constant. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the, that was the question of the, 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 the curing function is constant. We, we have uh, even issues with calibrating this constant curve. So we would have more issues with calibrating time varying kind of uh, curves. So if I understand that correctly, you're using a fixed budget that the uh, government can use to treat this disease. Um, what would happen if there comes another disease that would make uh, fewer budget on hepatitis C and more budget on that new emerging to see worthwhile from a social point of view. Um, because then in, in, in your optimal scenario, all the budget is spent and nothing is left. Yeah. So uh, th the thing is that what is decided is the endowment at the beginning. Because it, 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 to allow a smoothing consumption of a time means that you, uh, you, you need to delegate to the health authorities uh, the, 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 the spending, the smoothing of the, spend, of the spendings 
of the time. So this is an endowment given to the health authorities. So uh, obviously any event in the future uh, which make this, uh, the, 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 the importance of this endowment socially uh, ca cannot change, it's, it's, it's a given. So yeah, that's a restriction obviously, uh, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that's, that sets the question of uh, optimally deciding on, uh, on, um, on, on, on the level of the endowment at the beginning and maybe revisioned, but it's, it's, it's difficult to, uh, it's difficult to, uh, yeah, we can talk uh, about this, but it's difficult to do. Mm. Ah. Last question, maybe? Thank you very much, uh, Julien from LEM. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I wanted to come back to the, to the question of the price over time. I understand that you assume that it was constant over time to treat a single patient from hepatitis C. Um, as we discussed this morning, we know that there is a decreasing curve of price treatment in France. So what's interesting is that for the same price, you may get um, marginally better products in the future that would actually enable you to treat better those patients. Um, is this something that could be tested in the model or is it too specific already to the treatments available? No, it, it, it should be tested, up, uh, absolutely. That, that's related to this curve of efficiency uh, of, the, of, the, of the treatment. In fact, we, 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 we make it constant over time, but it's probably not. We don't think it is. And there are many, many things in this curve. There, there are trade-offs uh, with, uh, well, I've been talking about these trade-offs, and there are many, thing, many things in this curve. So uh, it, it would be interesting, and that's what we try to do um, in, in a companion paper, is to try to model the bargaining game between health authorities and, and firms and so price, prices will appear at that stage. But at the moment, we are very reduced form, and we, we don't have uh, very good quality data in order to fit this curve, so we maintain the assumption that it's constant, but it's probably not. So one conclusion of this work is also that there are many parameters. We, 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 we have to fit many parameters in order to try to understand this intertemporal trade-off, so any general conclusion about this should be taken with a lot of caution. Yes. I, I guess my point was that um, the rebound effect that we see, that you said is linked to the preference to the present, might be less marked if you take into account the fact that the price is decreasing, maybe. Maybe, yeah. No more questions? Okay, thank you very much, um, Thierry. Uh, <laughs> now we have the pleasure to um, listen to Carole Proper. I'm not going to do a brief summary of Carole Proper's uh, CV. Uh, she's a professor at the Imperial College London, and um, she's, or she was, member of President Macron's Excellent Expert uh, Commission. Uh, so, Carole, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is um, a kind of complete switch of topic. Um, and I'm not actually going to talk about savings at all, but I'm going to be talking about the pr production, which you could then think about in terms of whether it engaged savings. So what I'm going to talk about is team production in healthcare. Um, and the reason um, this is joint work with uh, two colleagues from the Institute for Fiscal Studies and the, the kind of full title is we're interested in team composition and evidence from nursing in, in the English NHS. And I, I'm going to hope that I kind of convince you why this is a kind of interesting topic to study. So team production is interesting, I think, in itself because teams play a big role in many forms of production. Teams have advantages. Uh, they allow specialization, they allow knowledge sharing, they allow complementarities. But interestingly, despite its pervasiveness, um, team production has been relatively understudied in economics, uh, from, except in two aspects. And these two aspects are that most studies focus on the impact of team organization on the behavior of individuals. 
So there's a huge literature, obviously, on peer effects, and you can think about a classroom or you can think about peers at work and peer effects. And then there's a, there's a large literature on financial incentives, how giving financial incentives to team members affects the output of a team. And a classic sort of set of examples of this are the, the kind of studies of strawberry pickers by Oriana Bandieri and her colleagues. A lot of those... A lot of those studies, for example, are actually studies of, of individual workers who are relatively low income and low skilled. But in many cases, the output is genuinely collective. I guess a, a kind of classic example of that would be sport, team sport, and understanding how the team operates and who the key players in that team are are important. And, and healthcare is a very uh, important example of team production. Uh, there are many teams in healthcare, and it's a growing belief that team production is important in things like the treatment of cancer that previously were thought of as, you know, you had some great doctor who did something and then other people who did something after him. But there's been a shift in many areas to thinking about team production because of this issue of specialization and knowledge sharing and complementarity of skills. So... Our focus, as I say, is on team composition in inpatient hospital care. So we're restricting ourselves to a particular setting, which is inpatient hospital care and nursing teams. The reason is that healthcare workers are around 10% of the labor force in many economies, and nurses are the largest group within that. In the UK, which is what I'm going to study, there are over half a million nurses and nursing support staff. There's also a worldwide shortage of nurses that's been going on for some time, and so it's important to make the best use of the range of skills that there are within the nursing labor force. And one, then on the other side, one key feature of hospital nursing is the organization of work, patient care, the work being patient care, into teams. Output is collective, and individuals rotate between teams frequently in an inpatient setting due to the need to provide 24-hour care and individuals don't work 24-7. So teams are subject to both unplanned and planned changes and that allows us essentially, we can exploit the changes in teams between what the optimal team ought to look like and what the actual team on the day, in our case three months later, does look like. And we, what we do in this paper is essentially exploit those changes in order to determine which members contribute most to a team. So what we're going to do is our focus is we're interested in both quantity and quality of team members. So our focus is how different levels of skills contribute to team output. Um, teams consist of nursing staff with more or less training. That's common worldwide. Nurses are at different levels of seniority, but there are also kind of two big groups of nurses. There are nurses who are essentially nursing assistants who do not hold in the main degree level qualifications, and nurses who essentially hold degree level qualifications and have much more medical training. One of the trends worldwide is because of shortages, particularly in the first type of nursing, is to substitute degree trained nurses at the margin with non-degree trained support staff. Um, that's, and, and we're going to be looking explicitly at that. But the other thing about these teams is they consist of individuals with more or less experience, just thinking about how long you've worked as a nurse, but also more or less familiarity with the firm that you work in, the hospital, and with other team members because of this issue of rotation and because of the issue that a nurse might be have worked 20 years in her life but worked it at three or four hospitals. So what we're going to do is we're going to use data at the 24-hour level. So we define a team as 24 hours of patient care and we're going to link those patients that are under the care of that team to the nursing teams responsible for their care. We're going to take as our case study one large English hospital group that consists of essentially three separate sites. 
Um, and we have about 44,000, uh, sorry, yeah, 44,000 patients, about three and a half million years, uh, hours of patient care. We look at about four and a half thousand unique staff working 300,000 shifts in about 59 wards in three hospitals. So we have very detailed data on who cares for which patients. And what we're going to do, and I'll kind of flesh this out a little bit, but is to exploit exogenous and we think plausibly random variation in the size and composition of the team on one important outcome of the team, which is patient mortality. There are lots of reasons that people in healthcare, when they're looking at production, focus on mortality. One is it's not a good outcome. Uh, patients care whether they exit the hospital alive or dead. But the second is that it's actually quite difficult to fake. And when you're worried about things, you, can't, uh, you don't want things that can be manipulated by the team. Uh, the third in our context is because it is what's called a never event, it's not meant to happen, though it does, um, it's recorded to, to the exact time at which it happens. So it allows us to link it to the appropriate team. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine, as I say, two things. The effect of team size. So teams vary in size, not because they're planned to vary in size, but because people are unexpectedly or expectedly absent. And we're going to ask the question, does it matter if the team's not fully staffed? And secondly, does it matter if which staff member is missing? Now, clearly at a kind of extensive margin, if you had nobody in the team, it would matter. But what we're asking is essentially at the intensive margin, at the marginal change. If there's a marginal change in either numbers or a marginal change in the type of staff who are there for unexpected reasons, what impact does that have? Who matters most? And as I say, it's important because teams contain a mixture of skills and one response to shortages is to replace highly trained nurses at the margin with less skilled nursing assistants. The second set of things that our data allows us to ask is how much does familiarity with the hospital, the ward and other team members matter? So in the broader language of firm familiarity, plant familiarity, and individual familiarity is kind of, if you want to link it to the broader issues in, in kind of thinking about team production. And that's important because one of the responses to shortages in hospitals across the world, and particularly the developed world, is to use agency nurses, nurses who are not employed by the hospital and are therefore not familiar with either the team or the hospital in which they're working. Um, so a kind of quick look, I'm not going to kind of, there's, there's lots of gory details behind this, but I'm not going to walk you through those, but just to kind of point out that we have three hospitals, um, about a third of, uh, two thirds of individuals in the year we look at, we only look at 2017, work in one hospital, but the remaining two thirds rotate. And then we look at uh, the number of units, which is essentially the number of wards not teams, but wards worked in. Um, and we find that band six work in about 6.5 units, that the lower band nurses, the lower band nurses are, are here on the left. The lower band nurses work in more, but there's quite a lot of rotation. So individuals don't always go to their place of work. So it's not like economics departments where you always go to the economics department. In this case, you're sent to the politics department. Okay. So we have, as I say, 53 wards in three hospitals. Teams on average, that's wrong, teams on average have about 20 nurses, 75% of whom are degree qualified. The average experience in a hospital is about six years. The average number of patients is about the same as the number of, of nurses, about 20. And on average, a nurse has worked for 30 days out of the 90 on a particular ward. So kind of what do we find? First of all, these changes are at the margin and we're not meant to have any shortages in this system. The system sets an optimal number of nurses who are rostered three months in advance to these wards. 
but because of unplanned shortages, somebody's sick, somebody's child is sick, someone's sent on a course, when the actual date comes, you have shortages, and we do find that unplanned shortages of nurses are associated with increased patient deaths. However, this is only driven by a shortage of nurses with degree level training. About two thirds of the nurses on a, a unit are, have degree level training, one third don't. An unexpected absence of a support staff worker makes no difference to a patient dying or not. Secondly, there are strong returns to seniority. One degree nurse absent for 12 hours, the average shift is 12 hours, from an average team of 20 nurses results in a 10% higher probability of death. But if the se most senior staff are absent, these are nurses with considerable amount of both extra qualifications and longer service, they, at, their impact is about twice that of a newly qualified nurse. And then finally, we find that experience in the hospital matters. Experience with your team members matters less, and experience on the ward matters, so people can move from, say, a haematology ward to another kind of ward. But what really matters is experience in the hospital or in the firm. The longer a nurse has worked in a hospital, the more her absence matters. Um, but again, the length of employment, which is about the same for nursing assistants as nurses, qualified nurses, does not matter for nursing assistants. In other words, nursing assistants are, at the margin are pretty fungible. So kind of policy implications. This is, I understand, a policy conference. So I thought I'd have some policy conference. So the increased use of less qualified nurses is likely to continue given nursing shortages and tight budgets. At the margin, our results indicate that that is probably not a good policy. Less qualified nursing uh, assistants are not effective substitutes for degree qualified nurses. And that means that if you did push that more, a change in skill mix could reduce quality of care. The other thing is that this is an industry in which people leave. They leave after they're first trained. They leave often when they don't want to work shifts anymore and they are conflicts with family responsibilities. And so one of the things that you might take from policy is whilst there's a worldwide shortage of trained nurses and trained nurses, one of the things that the hospital that we're looking at might do is try and invest in retention of degree trained nurses rather than substituting them with either agency nurses or nursing assistants. So um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carol, for your presentation. Uh, maybe I will start with a very uh, short question. Uh, would you be kind enough to give us some details regarding uh, on what you call plausibly random uh, variation? Because regarding the, the size of, um, of the teams, it makes, uh, it's uh, an assumption that, that makes uh, sense. But maybe regarding the composition, one may suspect that uh, there were some criterions when you adjust upward or downward the, the size, and uh, maybe these criterions are related to so, um, some a priori, maybe connected to your uh, results, or maybe not. Um. Well, we spent, so the short answer is if you're worried about endogeneity of patient severity, we have about 27 checks that shows essentially that patient severity i.e. the probability that a patient might die, is not related in any way to staff absences, planned or not planned, or to team size, planned or not planned. The kind of backing back from that, so we spend a lot of time being economists worried about exactly that, and I, there in the main paper, there's a, as I say, there's check after check of that, because that's key. Our key assumption that allows us this is that there is exogenous variation in the staff there and the types of staff there. But just backing back a bit, what happens in this is team rotors are set three months in advance by the senior managers 
in the hospital. Set, they're set together. So each type of ward has a given staffing complement of both nursing assistants and registered nurses. And then within registered nurses, levels, there are essentially three levels. Well, there are more. There are four levels of registered nurses. That's set three months in advance so that staff know two months in advance. There's a bit of kind of argy-bargy around that. There's, that's set two months in advance for the staff so they know which shifts they're working because obviously if you work with European working directives, you can't work all the time. And as I showed you, nurses work essentially a third of the time on, on, on a ward. So then the issue is why are people absent? Well, they're absent, as I say, because of short-term sicknesses and you can't replace them. Um, they're absent because of things like maternity leave. People, people suddenly find they need maternity leave or want to take maternity leave earlier than they said they were going to take maternity leave. Um, or they might come because you, you have a, a trust-wide training day for senior nurses and half your nurses have to go to that. So, but as I say, the main identification assumption is that that is exogenous to the severity of the patients that you have on the ward, and that it's not caused, for example, for example, a death the day before doesn't cause people to take the day off afterwards, and the answer is they don't. Mm. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, and just a last point um, before uh, sharing the... Uh, the questions uh, about uh, gender issue because in, in experimental economics they focus on a lot on um, if the, there is more or less cooperations uh, within teams according to the composition of, um, of teams. I, I, I don't want if you have checked this. We haven't looked at gender at all. We've looked at team familiarity. So whether you worked with a nurse in any setting in the hospital uh, in the last 90 days, we only have a year's data, in the last 90 days uh, uh, before you, before the, the events that we look at. We don't look at gender. We could look at homophily and gender. It's just not been a focus of what we, we've been interested in team familiarity because of this issue of handover. Now, clearly, you know, men may never hand over to women well, or men bosses may be different. So one of the issues we are going to look at, because we found such returns to senior staff, we're going to look at the value of bosses in a kind of AKM type setting, but a very different, a second paper. And there I think we will look at whether you've got male bosses or female bosses and how that affects team performance. Ariel? I don't want to take the mic from anyone else. Um, so that was terrific. I, I, this, this is great. I really like it. I had a question. I was just. I just looked it up. I was just reading this paper last week that I didn't know about, but it's over a decade old um, in management science. And they sort of in healthcare differentiate between the sort of learn what versus learn how of healthcare teams. And it strikes me as sort of in the spirit of second papers. I think it, this is already the first paper, but it seems to matter a lot for the managerial implications. So these senior nurses, if what they're doing is just, if is it the case that they have a better grasp on the current um, best practices for treating those patients? Or is it the case that they're just better managers and mentors of the younger staff? Because sort of, if it's the former, actually, the policy prescription is just like making sure everyone has more information about, about um, guidance from me medical professional societies. If it's the latter, that's like much harder to, the sort of mentorship piece you can't just substitute yeah. with teaching or something? I mean, I think they're both, that's super interesting. I'm not sure that we can actually get at that with our data, but we have been playing with ideas. As I say, we've been, going, we've been wanting to look at the value of bosses, so we might extract a boss fixed effect using AKM, because genuinely these are kind of random variations, and then kind of look at what that boss has done in terms of her time in the hospital, how much management experience she has in other wards, uh, perhaps how long her staff stay with her, though that's not a choice she has because people tend to be are rotated by this system. So we can try and get at some of that, and I think it's super interesting what makes a good boss in this context, and that has implications for, for what you want to do about staffing indeed. So, and then the, we probably also want to do a kind of back of the envelope allocation that if you allocated 
individuals to bosses who were good compared to not what kind of, or the other way around what kind of gains or losses might you make we're, we're pretty sure that there's going to be quite a bit of different differences um, whether we can get at exactly why there are those differences is another matter and then I have just one sort of half-baked comment um, and then I'll pass the mic one person to the left um, you talked a bit about this margin of substitution sort of at the bottom of the skill distribution. And so, and I, I'm completely, I believe the results you know, that you showed us, it doesn't seem like adding sort of more administrative staff helps, but what about this margin of substitution that we often talk about between things like very highly skilled nurses versus physicians? Are you able to see that in the data? We don't see any physician rotation. So we assume, um, this is just an assumption we can't actually test even at all, is that the physician rotation is exogenous to the nurse rotation at the de at the ward level. And that, I mean, given that how junior doctors are allocated, junior doctors essentially in the UK system work six months in a specialty. Senior consultants hardly ever come to the ward. They do a ward round every morning when they're followed by all their little acolytes, or their little acolytes have to follow them because they're the great god. Um, they, but in, you know, in oncology, you never get an oncologist on an inpatient ward. So these essentially are wards run by, by nurses. Our nurses, just a correction, our nursing assistants are not admin. They're people who uh, change so, drips, yeah. catheters, beds, take patients to the toilet. They're, they're basically workers who would otherwise work often in the social care sector, the nursing home sector. So they, they're patient-focused. They do patient-focused things, but, um, but... they they're not sort of they're not directly so treatment. Uh, changing bedpans is sort of important to do correctly, they but it's not wouldn't like a care... Be, they, right. they, probab they wouldn't be fitting catheters and other things, but they would be, they would be making sure that patients don't fall out of beds, don't fall on the way to the toilet. I mean... That sounds kind of trivial, but actually patient falls are really important. Yeah. Again, another ne never event in a hospital. Thank you. Uh, so this is just a quick follow-up. Do you ever see in the data a less skilled nurse being replaced by a nurse with higher skills? We don't. What we see is the team composition. So the team, we, yeah. So we've got, essentially, you never see a fill rate. So... The planned is, is known as the planned, and the fill rate in this hospital is the ratio of actual to planned. There are never more. That fill rate is never more than one. I see. <laughs> but, of course, you could have a... I mean, and that's what we are exploiting here, a day in which your missing nurse was a band six, uh, band five and above the, the, the degree qualifier, and you didn't have, any, your, you had a 100% fill rate for your nursing assistants. And in fact, the fill rates are orthogonal to each other. They're not correlated. So it's not like you have a run on that ward where everybody runs away madly, which is probably why we find that when we do all these tests of exogeneity, it holds. But yeah, you never get more than one. I see, I see. I because there's, I such a, there's such a shortage. It's yeah. hard enough to find. <laughs> so the average fill rate, I mean, you're usually about 4% down on average. And I, I was trying to understand if it was maybe just purely about quality or more about team production. You mentioned team familiarity. Um, I, I, I probably missed it. What is the effect of team familiarity? That we you actually, find? we do find some effect of team familiarity for, again, only skilled nurses. So team familiarity is Nurse J worked with Nurse I in the, last, in the previous 90 days to the board she's working on, anywhere in the hospital. That team familiarity does not matter at all for less skilled nursing assistants. It does matter for um, um, band, the, 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 the degree qualified folk, but it's kind of... If you, I'm not, I didn't present our estimates, but there's quite a lot of overlap in the confidence interval. I think even with, you know, 44,000 patients and all these shifts, we probably nearly need another year of data. But since it took me three and a half years to actually get this data, it's probably going to take another three and a half to get that 2018. Um, so we can't say anything, but there are certainly hints that team familiarity does matter 
uh, ward familiarity less, and hospital familiarity clearly does. And, th and that makes sense, because in a sense, it's the top hospital management e that kind of decides often on policies and how things work, and that's implemented by the teams. Thanks. Thank you very much for this study, it's, uh, it's fascinating. Um, have you had a look at team variability um, to the outcome of patients? Meaning, um, when I look at the French system, the, the team that will be on shift, and if you have 16 nurses in a team, will constantly change from day to day. I mean, uh, people will be put in two shifts with other people, but the, the, the same team will very likely not be together fully again until several weeks later, that, um, yeah, have, you look, have you look at how, how this affects patient outcome? That's exactly what we exploit. We exploit the fact that a team today won't contain the same people as the team tomorrow. And in fact, it may be several months before the exact same team is operating. So that's exactly what we're looking at. Okay, so the, the, um, the event of the same team being together is not occurring frequently enough to see if if a single patient, no, so that no, we haven't looked at team. whether the exact composition there it doesn't happen enough. As I say, a, a nurse works on average only a third of the time in 90 days, and we've only got a year. So the exact team, I'm not sure how often the exact exact team occurs, particularly because there are team absences. And for the last presentation, we, are, we have the pleasure to listen Julian Reif from a professor at uh, University of Illinois and uh, who had the go good idea to spend one year in uh, Toulouse School of Clinics. <laughs> no regrets. Um, well, uh, uh, thank you uh, so much for inviting me to talk today about my uh, research on the value of life. Uh, so this is based uh, on work that I've co-authored with uh, uh, Danny Bauer and Darius Lakdawalla. And so I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, what I think the implications of our research are uh, for some important questions uh, in healthcare policy. Uh, so, you know, many of you are probably familiar uh, with the notion of a value of statistical life. Uh, economists generally define it uh, as the amount of money that a large group of individuals is willing to pay to reduce a health risk that's expected to kill one of them. Um, so this value is used uh, widely in a, in a bunch of different areas ranging from environmental hazards to medical care to public safety and so on. Uh, so for example, the, uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency assumes a VSL of $10.7 million or 10.2 million euros uh, when deciding whether or not a particular environmental regulation passes a cost-benefit test. And VSL was also used to inform the cost-effectiveness analyses that are performed by a large number of different health agencies uh, around the world. And so, for example, uh, a recent study by uh, Terhad and co-authors used VSL to estimate that the French value of a quality, that's a quality-adjusted life year, lies somewhere between 150 and 200,000 euros. So in other words, this implies that the French healthcare system should be willing to pay up to this amount for a medical treatment that extends life by one year. Unfortunately, the, the model that underlines uh, these calculations uh, has some shortcomings. Uh, and in particular, in this conventional model, individuals can only be in one of two different health states. They're either alive or they're dead. And so this has at least two important consequences. Uh, first, it means that the model has nothing to say about whether VSL varies with underlying health. And it can't tell you if it's higher for a sicker individual versus a healthier individual. Um, in addition, the model can't distinguish between preventive care and, and medical treatment. Uh, and that's unfortunate uh, because it means that it can't answer uh, a number of important policy questions. So for example, 
researchers have long observed that societies and indeed even individuals uh, appear to invest less in preventive care than in medical treatment. Now, is this something that is undesirable or inefficient? Right? The conventional model can't answer this question uh, because it can't distinguish between preventive care and medical treatment. Right? Um, uh, in addition, uh, the model has nothing to say regarding whether or not reimbursements should be more generous for medical treatments of more severe diseases. Right? So in, in countries that practice strict cost effectiveness analysis, they generally take the view that a health gain of one year should be worth the same to a mildly ill individual as it is uh, to a very sick individual. But if you ask people on surveys, they reply very often that one should prioritize extending the life of a very sick patient. Okay? Now, which of these perspectives is more consistent with a standard economic model? So that's something we can begin thinking about uh, with this framework that I'll be describing today. So at a high level, what we do in our study is extend the conventional model to accommodate multiple health states. So in other words, rather than just being alive and dead, living individuals in this model uh, can reside in an arbitrarily large number of health states. Right? So we denote that arbitrarily large number as n, and so for convenience, we'll call the state of death uh, a state n plus one. Okay? So you can think of these health states as corresponding to different illnesses or something more finely grained. All right? And a health shock, essentially in this setting, uh, corresponds to transitioning from one health state to another health state. And importantly, an individual's quality of life and their probability of dying will depend on what health state they happen to be in currently. So we use this, uh, this setting to extend the idea of VSL uh, to a more general concept that we term the value of statistical illness or VSI. So in, in words, VSI is the value of reducing the risk of transitioning from some health state I to another health state J. All right, so VSL will be identical uh, to our measure of VSI when that state J is death, but VSI is a lot more general, so it allows us to begin uh, uh, posing some interesting questions. So first of all, VSI will allow us to compare risk reduction values across people who reside in different health states. Right, so for example, we can ask, is VSL higher for somebody in a very sick state as compared to somebody in a relatively healthy state? Right? And that's important for understanding whether there is a severity premium whereby it may make sense to pay more for treatments of very severe illnesses. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a couple slides. Um, in addition, VSI will allow us to compute uh, how much a healthy individual is willing to pay not just to prevent their risk of death, but also their risk of contracting other illnesses, such as Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, et cetera. So that's the, the theory in the paper anyway. Um, uh, and the final part of our study, we apply this model to data to try to assess whether or not uh, the insights from our model um, actually generate some empirically meaningful uh, results. Uh, so we work with uh, some rich survey data from the United States that provides us with information about people's mortality probabilities, uh, their quality of life, and crucially, information on how these vary uh, by age and by the number of comorbidities that individuals have. And then to keep the model tractable, we take all the individuals in our data set and divide them up into 20 different health states where a health state depends on the number of chronic conditions you have, so for example, diabetes, cancer, and so on, uh, as well as the number of impairments you have. So do you have difficulty walking, difficulty bathing, et cetera? So uh, this slide just gives you a, a brief snapshot uh, of the data that we use. So it presents some summary means for the 50-year-olds in our data set. So these means are broken down by what uh, health state the individual is in. So depending on that health state, life expectancy for 50-year-olds uh, ranges from 31 years for the healthiest ones down to 9.1 years for people in the sickest health state. 
We also measure their quality of life using a health index, which ranges from zero to one. So one basically indexes perfect health. These are individuals that can run marathons, right? They have no pain. Uh, they're in perfect physical condition. Um, and it ranges down to zero, uh, which is the equivalent of death. And then we also have information on how much people spend on medical care as a function of their age and what health state they're in. So uh, before I show you our main results, I wanna just give you a, a, a hypothetical example of the kind of output our model produces to try to convey some of the intuition uh, behind what we're doing. So this slide plots VSL uh, for a person who was initially healthy at age 50 we assume their VSL was $6.8 million. It's easy to use a different value uh, if you prefer. Um, as is typical in these models, VSL declines with age, um, but then this individual suffers a health shock at age 60 and a severe health shock at age 70. Right? And you'll notice that in both of these cases, uh, VSL deviates from this trend and actually increases. Right? Now what's happening here is this individual's life expectancy was significantly reduced following these health shocks, right? And this means that it is now optimal for her to spend down her wealth uh, in, her, uh, low, in her fewer remaining years, right? That increases her willingness to pay for lots of things, including health and longevity. Now in our paper, what we do is we repeat this exercise for a population of individuals who are representative of the US population, okay? So this is the, the result of that exercise for that population. The, the solid blue line is average VSL for individuals between the ages of 50 and 80. And then these light blue lines show you VSL for selected percentiles in this population. All right, so one takeaway here is that even though we set this up to look initially only at people who were healthy at age 50, there's already a lot of heterogeneity 20 years later. All of that heterogeneity is coming from random health shocks of people, uh, uh, that people suffer uh, throughout the course of their life. Now, with these data in hand, we can now calculate a bunch of statistics of interest. Uh, and in, in the, for the sake of time, I will, sh I will uh, present uh, just what for us at least was the most striking result. So this graph here plots the value of a quality adjusted life year for the 70 year olds in that data set as a function of what health state they're in. All right, so recall there were 20 health states in this model and I've uh, arrayed them here in order of increasing life expectancy. So for individuals who are age 70 and in the best health state, right? So they have a life expectancy or a quality adjusted life expectancy of about 11 years. Their value of equality is about $260,000. However, this increases all the way up to $660,000 for individuals in the worst health state where their quality adjusted life expectancy is less than three years. Right. So in other words, among the individuals who are in the worst health, they're willing to pay more than 2.5 times more per quality than individuals who are in the healthiest state. So um, I think I have a couple minutes left, uh, so I want to just conclude with a, a, a few thoughts uh, for discussion. Um, so first I want to return to this question about uh, preventive care. As I mentioned, it remains a puzzle why so few people and systems appear to uh, invest in prevention. And I'll give you an example to make this concrete. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that lifestyle modification programs for diabetes are in fact quite effective at preventing diabetes. Yet people at risk of diabetes right, appear uninterested in these programs. Um, in my own research on workplace wellness programs, there was a lot of uh, initial excitement and hope that these programs would increase the health and well-being of workers by making it easier for people to engage in preventive care at the work site. Um, but the best evidence we have so far to date suggests these programs do very little, if anything, and participation in these programs remains stubbornly low. Right? So our study provides what we think is just a simple, rational explanation for these previous findings. Right? And it's that individuals simply value preventive care less than medical treatment. And thus we shouldn't be surprised to see underinvestment in preventive care, especially when other potential explanations such as the fact that insurers may also not face the proper incentives 
uh, to pay for preventive care, and also maybe that consumers are making mistakes on top of this, those explanations are only going to reinforce uh, this result uh, that we find. Uh, and then finally, we think our study also has implications for uh, the reimbursement of, of health care. Um, so as, as I mentioned before, um, in, in standard cost effectiveness, one assumes that there is only a single value for a quality adjusted life year. Um, but this is very counterintuitive, right? If you talk to people, they very frequently say it's important to prioritize the health of the severely ill. Um, and uh, this notion that we should pay more for the treatments of severe diseases, this is sometimes called uh, um, having a severity premium, has already found its way into some policies. So for example, the UK several years ago established something called the New Cancer Drugs Fund, which pays, basically sets aside extra money to pay for cancer drugs over and above what the standard cost effectiveness threshold is. Um, this was very controversial. So I, I'm showing here an editorial that was published in The Lancet uh, arguing against this fund. Uh, the, the Lancet editorial basically argues that uh, this is a not an efficient use of money, right? It's a waste of resources. Essentially, from their perspective, any ad hoc adjustment to the cost effectiveness threshold is necessarily inefficient and subjective, right? Um, but you know, our framework suggests, uh, suggests otherwise. It suggests that, in fact, there may be a very good reason, at least from an economic perspective, right, to reimburse more generously uh, for treatments of severe illnesses. And you know, there certainly remains a lot of work to be done incorporating uh, the insights that uh, we've generated in our study into uh, the standard practice of cost effectiveness, uh, we think already the, these preliminary results do suggest uh, or provide some support uh, for the idea of a severity premium. And so I think I will uh, end it there um, and open it up for questions and comments. Thank you very much, Julien. Jean. Yeah, I was wondering how this fits you know, this fits with the notion that uh, actually you may want to save people who have a long expected uh, life. Uh, I mean, think about COVID, for example. There was a shortage, and then they prioritize uh, the people who had a long uh, lifetime, expected lifetime, over the people who are going to die anyway. So it doesn't quite fit. Uh, so the question is actually uh, doesn't resonate to me at least, and uh, it doesn't seem like it resonates to you uh, either. The, the kind of preference for the severity premium, as you call it, it's kind of strange, right? Uh, is that because there is an imperfect financial market, so I have a lot of money, you know, and uh, I, I I hear that I'm going to live for only one year. I'm willing to spend all that money which would not happen, for example, if I had a monthly pension mm. <laughs> and so on. Uh, I don't know, I mean, wh what's going on here? I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. kind of strange. Yeah, that's a good question. There, there are a lot of points you brought up there. Uh, so first of all, to be clear, we're focused here on the value of a quality adjusted life year, right? So this is per unit of health. An individual who has, you know, 10 qualities left in their life, that's going to be worth 10 times more. So this is talking about, and that's the basis of what we think of for reimbursements. Um, you're correct that imperfect financial markets are very important uh, for this result. Um, they have uh, significant effects on individuals' willingness to pay um, because it affects, you know, how much money and wealth and savings uh, they have. Um, there are some alternative ways to think about that um, that we're, you know, we're thinking about for follow-up papers in terms of different welfare functions one might use. Here we're using just willingness to pay, sort of set up in a real world uh, setting. But I agree that sort of bigger picture welfare questions are, are co very complicated here. And so we have not fully uh, waded into that literature yet. Uh, uh, Luca, yeah. Katarina. I had, a, I had a very similar question, so I'm just going to expand on it uh, a little bit. It, um, Maybe uh, the, actually more of a clarification then. It seems like there is a maybe a fixed correlation between um, life expectancy 
um, in, in the states that you define, and also the quality of life adjustment parameter. Mm -hmm. um, does that correlation matter for your result? And if you had a different, you know, you could think of those two things as moving completely separately, right? You could, I could have a disease that really affects me, but doesn't affect my life expectancy, um, vice versa. Yeah. Does that matter? Yeah, they're, they're certainly correlated. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, uh, basically, if you assume quality of life does not change uh, in this setting, um, it has very little effect on our qualitative results, at least using the typical parameterizations that are used uh, in this literature. A big challenge is that we don't really know uh, the effect of health on someone's uh, you know, uh, marginal utility of consumption. Um, that's an open question. Do I want, you know, am I more willing to spend money if I'm very sick? Well, maybe yes, if I have to buy, uh, uh, you know, new, uh, out, new I, have to, I, have to, I have to retrofit my home. Right? Maybe no, if I'm just bedridden and have no use for money. Um, but that's not what's driving our results. So um, in our paper, we dig into that. Thanks. Katarina. And then, uh, so your results basically is, uh, is a preference. Uh, I mean, people reveal their preferences, right? But the, then the thing is, how, how do you aggregate that on a social welfare function as you, I mean, because of course, if I'm dying tomorrow, I'm willing to spend all my money today, perhaps not. But I mean, uh, another thing is like from a societal point of view, where do I want to allocate money? Because those are the preferences of people, but then what do I want to do from a collective perspective? Yeah, no, this is a good question. It's related to, to what uh, Jean uh, brought up. So here we're just taking the stance of, of measuring this using willingness to pay, which is what many people use. It's not the only one. Um, and so we can look at alternative frameworks as something we're interested in. What I will say, this is also in response to Jean's question, you can also use this model to, for example, look at a single healthy individual and just say, what is my willingness to pay to reduce the risk of different illnesses? And here you don't have this issue of their wealth is changing. Um, and you still find here that your willingness to pay uh, to reduce the risk of more severe illnesses is higher per unit of health. Uh, than it is uh, uh, for less severe illnesses, although the, the magnitude is smaller, so it, 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 is, uh, it does matter. Uh, Julia, um, I wanted to know if you are able to disentangle when you are talking about prevention between primary and secondary prevention, and on the other hand, uh, if, you, uh, if you measure uh, risk preferences, especially risk aversion and prudence, because uh, we know from a um, theory that there is a convoluted relationship between prevention and uh, risk aversion, and uh, especially with, uh, with, uh, with prudence. Because when, uh, when you want to avoid the worst uh, scenario, maybe uh, the worst scenario is when the prevention is costly and it doesn't work. So uh, if you are very risk averse and prudent, maybe it's, um, you don't want to be in this, uh, in this uh, scenario. So I wanted to know if you have some measures of, um, of uh, risk preferences. Yeah, so we, we use sort of just what the standard measures are in the literature with, without getting too technical. You know, prudence does matter uh, for these results. Um, if you use whatever the standard estimates are, you find that essentially you get this effect where VSL can increase following a health shock. Um, but if you assume an extreme enough value for this, um, it, can, it can reverse it. So that's, uh, that's actually one of the new things we, we show in the study. Prior to this, people thought it could only go up. It turns out that actually more generally, it can go up or down sort of depending on that parameter. Uh, but it's sort of a, it's a fairly technical condition. Yeah. No more questions? Okay, thank you very much, Julien, and to... <laughs> Thank you to uh, Carole and uh, Thierry too. And now the last words uh, for Jean. Yeah, I discovered with a lot of emotion that I was supposed to conclude <laughs> this session. Uh, so I have to call it a day before you move on to state uh, N plus one. It has been a very intense uh, day and afternoon. I would like to, re to thank the speakers very much. I learned a lot and this was a great afternoon. So uh, I just, I'm not going to um, embark into a Fidel Castro speech, so that will be very brief. I would just uh, like to, 
to thank all those who made this happen, um, this conference happen. So on the scientific side, Pierre for organizing everything. Pierre and, and the team, I mean, you've seen a number of uh, people in our team, both faculty and students. There are others you may have met uh, at coffee. Um, this is great. I want to thank Ev and, and Cecile for the TSE site for organizing that, organizing that very efficiently. I'm very grateful as well to, to Lem, to Eric, and I don't remember, <laughs> Juliette, and uh, I don't know who is still around, but uh, Lem was very instrumental in this whole uh, you know, venue and so on. So that was, that was very, so we're, we are very, very grateful, and I think uh, all those deserve a big, a big round of applause. Yes. Yeah. 